So I'm from Oregon originally, and I grew up kind of in the middle of nowhere. The nearest town was like five miles away, and I'm using the term town pretty loosely. Total population was like 150 people. And I just didn't really fit in very well. I love science and logic, and I wore my pants pulled up way too high. And because the gods hate teenagers, appearing serious and rational is pretty much a lost cause when you're that age. Eighth grade is just embarrassing for everyone. And I remember this one experience so clearly. I was headed out of school at the end of the day, and a spider had constructed a web right about base level for a teenager. Very considerate spider. And so when I walked out to go be with my friends, I got a face full of spider web. And <laughs> if you've ever seen someone walk into a spider web from far away, it's sort of an amazing thing, right? They're walking, they're walking, totally reasonable, totally sane, nothing weird. And then out of the blue, from nowhere, they just start freaking out. It looks like they're like doing kung fu against ghosts, you know, it's crazy. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, they just look insane. And of course my friends saw it, and of course they tease me about being completely out of my mind, because it is the job of your friends to remind you that you're not whoever you want to be. If you want to be a scientist when you grow up, they'll tease you about being irrational. And of course, I did grow up to be a scientist. And what's better, I grew up to be a scientist that studies irrationality. And so how people make decisions related to their emotions and other things. So this talk is really just my way of saying, screw you, teenage classmates, I made it, right? I am here. But more importantly, I want to talk about walking into spider webs. In some sense, Everyone watching this is like teenage me. Uh, we want to be thought of as rational and reasonable because in many ways that's how we culturally define intelligence. And there's nothing wrong with that. I am totally on board with wanting people to act based on evidence. I'm a scientist. And so to take an orderly approach to problem solving seems very important to me. But where I start to get uncomfortable isn't with how we use reasonable, but with the reverse and how we label people unreasonable or irrational. Because there's no doubt unreasonable and irrational are descriptions that we use to punish people and to keep them from sources of power and participating in power fully. Um, the women watching this know what I'm talking about. We love to call women irrational as a way of belittling them, of implying uh, that their actions come from a place of emotion rather than logic or evidence. The research here is you know, sort of endless. You can look at the performance reviews of women in the workplace and find all of these uh, adjectives that are used to consistently describe women as irrational or emotional or you know, sort of other kinds of, of stereotype judgments about their basis of their thing. And they never sort of see that in men's performance reviews. You don't see the same use of adjectives. You can even see it actually um, in, in when we're describing imaginary women, right, in fiction. They actually have the same sort of use of emotional adjective. This is a systematic, pervasive problem in how we identify women. And it isn't just about gender. Think about young black men. Right? Young black men are more likely to drop out of high school, less likely to go to college. Um, surely they want to be successful. And surely they know education is a factor in their future success. How can they not be putting those two things together? How can they be so irrational? And, of course, it isn't just gender and race, it's not just women and black men. You can see this across the board. When poor rural whites support a, you know, a certain type of political candidate, the media often describes them as voting against their rational self-interest, which is usually coded to the fact that their economic potential will go down as a result of the policies of that candidate. I mean, surely they realize that cutting taxes on the rich will put a larger burden on the working poor. How can they be so irrational? But what is irrational really? I mean, hopefully you can all acknowledge that when I walked into that spider web, I was acting perfectly rationally, right? Something was restricting my mouth and I reacted to clear it. You know, and if I say it in a, in a particular voice, it really does sound particularly rational, um, perfectly sort of understandable, even if the action itself looks very strange. I mean, try to think of my action as narrated by like Dan Rather. Something restricted his mouth and he acted quickly to remove it. You know, that sounds really good. The reason walking into spider webs appears irrational is because the observer doesn't see the spider web. That is, they don't see the pressures that created the behavior. They only see the behavior itself. And because the behavior itself seems on the surface inexplicable, your mind doesn't say, oh yes, maybe he walked into a spider web. Maybe that's why he's acting so crazy. It just seems like I just all of a sudden started acting bizarre. And so when we judge people, uh, only on the behavior and not on the pressures that create the behavior because they're invisible to us, 
then that's where this, we start calling people irrational. That's where this problem comes in. I mean, let's go back to women in the workplace for a second. It is a fact, an indisputable, 100% true, economists agree fact that women are underpaid relative to their male counterparts. And part of the reason for that is women act in a way that appears irrational with regard to pay equity. They don't ask for raises as often, they don't take credit for their accomplishments as often, they don't speak up in meetings as often, and so they don't get promoted as often. But those behaviors aren't random, they're not imaginary. They don't ask for raises because we socialize them not to, and we punish them when they do. They don't take credit for their accomplishments for the same reasons. We socialize them not to, and then punish them if they do. Women don't speak up in meetings because men don't shut up long enough for them to do so. And if they do speak up, uh, or they interrupt us so that they have a space to talk, we call them bossy, and we go back to labeling them with emotional adjectives. But men don't typically see all those pressures that are creating those behaviors. They don't see systematic bias, they don't see the socialization, they don't see the punishments. So they look at the behaviors and they say, well, this is a meritocracy. These women are silent in meetings and they don't seem to have any accomplishments that they're telling me about, so there's no reason for me to promote them. This pattern plays out over and over and over and over again in situations of systematic bias. Our young black men absolutely know that education is fundamental to success. They also know that they are massively more likely to be incarcerated or killed by the police and deprived of their opportunity to use that education, which makes spending time elsewhere while they're young perfectly understandable. And poor rural whites who support candidates are voting based on more than just their economic self-interest. Right? The need to belong is a very core, fundamental human identity need. And candidates offer it to them. They say, you know, wear the hat, say the slogan, and you too can be part of the movement. We call all of these people unreasonable because we don't actually understand the pressures that are affecting them, the pressures that are creating those behaviors. And rather than trying to understand those pressures, trying to, do, to see where things come from, it's easier to simply say that they don't exist. Right? To call women unambitious, or young black men lazy, poor rural whites stupid. It's easier to say there's something wrong with the people than to acknowledge how their environment affects them. And when those judgments come from someone with power, we have a recipe for an incredibly toxic cycle, an incredibly toxic system. It isn't just that people are being labeled. Those labels then become the justification for oppressing them. When we deny the existence of the spider webs, we are free to say that those people act too unpredictably, too irrationally to participate in power. Well, so what? I want to propose that in a world of spider webs, we need a very specific approach to change. Compassionate, scientific activism. Compassionate, scientific activism. Why compassionate? Well, compassion is the first step in changing behavior because compassion says, I believe that the pressures that may be affecting you are things I can't see. And so I will treat you with kindness and assume that your behavior is based on something real, real to you. And when you look at modern therapy, like dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, right, they make this a routine part of how people understand each other. Right? Validation, it's a skill they teach. Right? Now notice, by the way, I'm not asking you to agree with all behavior. That isn't what validation is. I certainly don't agree with dropping out of high school or voting for bad, oppressive leaders. Assuming that someone's behavior is based on something real to them doesn't mean you agree with the thing that they're doing. But if you don't accept their behavior as valid within the domain of their experience, valid according to real pressures that affect them, the only alternative is to believe that their behavior is random. And random behavior, by definition, can't be changed. But that's what we're really talking about. Getting rid of the use of rational to label behavior matters because ultimately we want to change those behaviors for the better. We don't want women to sit silently in meetings. We don't want young black men to drop out of high school. We don't want poor rural whites to vote for leaders that will oppress them. But we can't hope to change behavior if we don't see those behaviors as fundamentally driven by real pressures that can be changed. And so we need to be compassionate and accept that spider webs exist. But compassion isn't enough. Because it isn't enough to say, I believe your experiences are real. Compassion is necessary, but it's not sufficient. This is where science comes in. Because if compassion says, I believe that spider webs exist, science says, and I believe so much, I believe so much that those spider webs exist that I will go 
find them. That's what research is. Research makes the invisible forces visible. Now, it's important to take a second to emphasize here, I'm talking about science, not scientists. Science as a process is specifically about finding and understanding the things that shape other things, right? It's about finding and understanding those spider webs. Scientists, like me, as practitioners of science, are highly flawed and subject to bias and have played a huge part in creating the world in which we exist today. I'm a scientist, and you can ask anyone. I am highly, highly flawed and full of biases. But we need the process that is science to map the spider webs and show that they exist. Because we already do this for the people that we've decided are rational. I didn't pick women and young black men and poor rural whites randomly as examples. We use the notion of irrationality to perpetuate a sexist, racist, classist power structure that continues to bend over backwards to put white men like me at the top. And because we put white men at the top, we study the pressures that shape their behavior more than anyone else's, guaranteeing that we understand those pressures and can support our notion of their rationality in this sort of endless loop. Because we see their spider webs, when they act imperfectly, we are more likely to attribute their imperfections to their environment rather than to them. And so we're best at changing the behaviors of white men and creating a better world for them because we understand the pressures that affect them. And if we want to change behavior for everyone, then we need to include everyone in our understanding of how pressures change behavior. We have to be diverse and inclusive in our research as scientists. All right. So, we started with compassion, we've added science. But even compassionate science isn't enough. I am, dun dun dun, a PhD dropout. And I left academia primarily because I found out that it is Gnostic in nature. That is, the way you measure success in academia is by generating unique knowledge. And that's not a bad thing. Remember, I want us to see the spider webs, to find out that they actually exist. But if someone is struggling in a spider web, I don't want to be the person describing the thickness of the threads. If someone is struggling, I want to be the person who tries to set them free. And that's why we need action, that last word, that activism. Because compassion says, I can't see the spider web, but I believe that it is there. Right? And science says, and I believe so hard, so hard, that I will find that spider web. But it is only action, only activism that says, and when I find it, when I find that spider web, I will tear it down. I left academia and became an applied scientist because it allows me to take that last step to find the systematic spiderwebs and start to pull them apart. We live in a world of deep structural inequity. Some people are just realizing this, but some have experienced it their whole lives. I like spiderwebs to talk about this because they aren't accidental. They're well structured, they're deliberate, and they're designed to ensnare. And if we want to change the world that we live in, the deeply unequal place that we have built together, we need to learn and practice these three skills. Compassion and science and activism are not just philosophies. They're behaviors, ways of being. And it's incumbent on all of us to want to create change and to learn these tools to do so. Because this transformation from focusing on behaviors to focusing on pressures is magical. It's one of the most immediately impactful things that any of us can do, because instead of trying to box people in by dealing with their irrationalities, we reconfigure the systems to set them free. We weaken some pressures and strengthen others to help create an environment where people can behave according to their best intentions, to the things that they actually are uh, there that are important to them, like their beliefs and their values. Now look, that doesn't mean everyone will act the same or even act well because we have tremendous variety in our beliefs and values. But we want people to be able to act authentically. And that's what real rationality is, the chance to do what we believe in, to make actions and intentions line up. And when we do that with compassionate scientific activism, we get to a better world. We believe people when they say their spider webs exist. We spend time and money and energy finding and understanding those spider webs. And then we tear them down. Because when you clear away the cobwebs, you find out who's really doing kung fu against ghosts and who's struggling to be free, struggling to pull the strings from their mouth, struggling to breathe. So let's do it again. Compassionate, I believe the spider webs exist. Scientific, I find and study them. Activism, 
I tear them down. Compassionate, scientific activism. Thank you so much.